Um, all right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, tonight is part 11 of our study and reading of the Srimala Devi Simhanada Sutra, the lion's roar of Queen Srimala. Um, tonight, we are in chapter 13. And just to remind you, this chapter, this sutra has 15 chapters. So we're, we're nearing the end. And in many ways tonight, this chapter 13, I really feel like this is sort of very much the, the heart of the sutra. I, a lot of ideas that Sri Mala has been laying out in her, in her discourse, in her teaching, a lot of those threads are kind of going to all come together. And I, I know I keep saying that, but because she's been weaving is, is the thing. She's been weaving this together. Um, but the idea is, is that we're coming to sort of the, the final part of it. Um, the one idea that we're going to focus on tonight is this idea that I have on the board, which is the Dharma Dattu. This is a very important idea to Mahayana Buddhism, comes up a lot. Um, so we're going to talk about that. But the main idea that Queen Srimala has been talking about is an idea that is called the Tathagata Garbha, the womb of Tathagata or the womb of Tathagatas, plural, um, the womb of thus come ones, in other words, sort of the womb of Buddhas, um, Tathagata being kind of another word for Buddha in that sense. Um, but she originally laid out this idea of the Tathagata Garbha, the womb of uh, Tathagatas. She originally laid this out in chapter nine. That was the first time she mentioned this idea. She built up to this idea. And then in chapter nine, she finally introduced it by name. And since chapter nine, she has been clarifying what she means by this idea. And of course, in particular, she's been talking about how the earlier um, or followers of the early type of Buddhism what are called Shravakas and Pratakya Buddhas. She's been saying that this idea of the Tathagata Garbha, it's beyond the wisdom, beyond the knowledge of Arhats and Pratakya Buddhas. So we've been sort of very curious, what is this womb of Buddhahood? Um, and so again, she introduced it and she's been going off about it. And then we are now picking up from last week we arrived at chapter 13, um, and even though we did read uh, well into chapter 13, um, I'm going to actually start from the beginning of chapter 13. Um, there's a, an essential idea that gets mentioned at the beginning of this chapter that if I don't remind us of it, uh, it won't be as significant at the end. And ultimately, my plan for tonight is to basically do a very, very close reading of chapter 13. Again, this is really kind of the heart of the sutra in that way that a lot of ideas that she's been building up to are about to get kind of <clears throat> as clear as they can get. Um, and so, yeah, um, hopefully this idea of the Tathagata Garbha is is. You, that you're familiar with it from at least the last session or your study of Mahayana Buddhism in general. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and read again from the top just to introduce these ideas, start to get the, the Dharma wheel turning there. Um, and so again, starting, we're going to do chapter 13 tonight, and I'm starting from the beginning, even though we already read a little bit of it last week. So. Srimala, who again, by the way, this whole sutra has been Queen Srimala discoursing, kind of in front of the Buddha, maybe to, to the Buddha, for the Buddha, but this has been sort of a, 
uh, a, a discourse to the Buddha in that way. And so she says, world honored one, samsara, the cycle of birth and death and rebirth and death, then rebirth and death is based on the Tathagata Garbha. Because of the Tathagata Garbha, the beginning of samsara cannot be known. World honored one. If one says that because there is the Tathagata Garbha, there is samsara, that person speaks well. World honored one. The cycle of birth and death means the cessation of the sense faculties and the immediate arising of new sense faculties. World honored one. The two phenomena, birth and death, are the Tathagata Garbha itself. They are called birth and death from a conventional point of view. World honored one. Death means the cessation of sense faculties and birth means the arising of new sense faculties. The Tathagata Garbha, however, neither arises nor ceases to be, neither emerges nor vanishes. It is beyond the realm of conditioned things. World honored one. The Tathagata Garbha is permanent and indestructible. Therefore, world honored one, the Tathagata Garbha is the base, the support, the foundation of the wisdom of liberation. It is also the base, the support, and the foundation of all conditioned phenomena. World honored one. If there were no Tathagata Garbha, there would be no abhorrence of suffering and longing for nirvana. How is that? The seven factors of enlightenment, the six consciousnesses and their objects are momentary, non-abiding, and therefore cannot retain the experience of suffering. Hence, they are unable to abhor suffering or aspire to nirvana. The Tathagata Garbha has no beginning, neither arises nor ceases, and can retain the experience of suffering. It is the cause of sentient beings' renunciation of suffering and aspiration for nirvana. Okay, that's where we got to last time. And the main point I wanted to just review before we move any further is that she's talking about this kind of re-imagining or re-understanding of samsara itself, a re-imagining of birth and death itself. And what she's done is she said, oh yeah, samsara. Yeah, that's about birth and death and rebirth and birth and death and rebirth. Yeah. Yeah. And when you die, there's the cessation of senses. And then when you're reborn, there's the arising of senses again. And so what she started to do is, is take samsara out of the context of, of being birthed like a baby, like out of, a, out of a, a, a vaginal womb in that sense. So taking birth and death out of that context and putting samsara, putting the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, she's putting it in the context of the moment-to-moment -moment, um, shifting of the mind, the moment-to-moment -moment thought ceasing and a new thought arising. In other words, a kind of birth, death, and rebirth with every moment or every thought in a way She's going to clarify this, but I just wanted to really emphasize what she said, where she was redefining samsara in that sense. And doing this kind of contrast in that way with this idea of the Tathagata Garbha. And tonight, we're going to get a, as close as I think I could get us, me, you know, me, what I'm capable of, 
we're going to get really close because she's about to define the Tathagata Garbha even more, but in perfect Buddhist fashion, she's going to kind of do it in some negative senses, but she will start to say what the Tathagata Garbha is. But we're going to have to take a moment to discuss these four things before we get there. So the next uh, paragraph, the very next paragraph of this chapter reads this, world honored one, the Tathagata Garbha is not a self, a personal identity, a being, or a life. The Tathagata Garbha is not in the domain of sentient beings who believe in a real self, whose thinking is confused, or who cling to the view of emptiness. So we're going to work on that, par that little paragraph right there. World Honored One, the Tathagata Garba is not a self, a personal identity, a being, or a life. Okay, so I will need this shortly. So we're, I wrote those on the board, and I labeled them as these four characteristics. These would be called lakshana, of course, in Sanskrit, in our Buddhist studies. And these are the four characteristics. They're the four characteristics that uh, Srimala just mentioned. They are the atman, the self. I'm, I'm going to go deeper into each of these, but there are the atman, the self or the soul or the essence. There is the pudgala, what they call the personal identity, what is also known as personality or individuality. The third characteristic is the characteristic of sattva, of being a sattva. And a sattva means a sentient being or a sentient creature. And the fourth characteristic she mentioned was this idea of life, livingness, and it's jiva. And those are the four things that we're going to do a little talking about. Um, the Atman Pudgala, or the Atman, the Pudgala, Sattva, and Jiva. So these four characteristics are very important. And I want to remind you of something that came up earlier. In fact, it was the, the, the focus of part eight of this series. And it came from a section where Sri Mala was speaking about the Vajra-like wisdom of the Buddha, that only the Vajra-like wisdom of a Buddha can cut off the underlying, delu the underlying defilement of delusion. That's more or less what she said. And she just sort of put it out there as the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom. And I want to come back to that phrase, the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom, because one of the original sources, if not the original source for understanding these four ideas, these four dharmas or lakshana, is a very important Mahayana Buddha sutra called the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, more commonly known as the Diamond Sutra. But it's important tonight that you remember that it's called the Vajra Sutra. So the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra is a fairly short little sutra, and it is on the subject of Pranya. Many historians, scholars, myself included, consider this Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra to be the original Pranyaparamita Sutra. That, be that became a whole genre of Buddha sutras. Many, many, many Mahayana sutras that are about pranya. Some of them are very, very large, vastly large. The Diamond Sutra or the Vajra Sutra is probably, uh, not probably, it, it definitely is the most famous, the most well-known of the Pranyaparamita sutras. And again, many people think it's the first one. 
so it's in that sutra and it's very early on in that sutra that the buddha breaks down these four characteristics again these are called lakshana and the sutra is very profound and it begins very quickly and the prior the kind of the focus of the discourse is the buddha explaining to a shravaka an arhat somebody from that earlier uh, buddhist tradition the buddha is explaining to subhuti an arhat what it means to be a bodhisattva that's more or less Subhuti's question. Subhuti asked the Buddha, like, how, do, how does one develop supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment? How does one become a Buddha? How does one tread the Bodhisattva path and become a Buddha? And the Buddha's answer is very direct. It's very, he doesn't mince words. What he says, in, and this happens in chapter three, and it's the most important part of the sutra, it's where the Buddha says, well, a Bodhisattva doesn't cling to or isn't attached to. In fact, they don't even have in any way, shape, or form the characteristic of a self, an individuality, the characteristic of being a sentient being, or even the characteristic of being alive, of having jiva, of, of life. The whole rest of the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra is a discourse by the Buddha about these four characteristics, and in particular about how a bodhisattva doesn't have these characteristics. The sutra uses, um, in different chapters, he uses different language. Sometimes he says bodhisattvas are not attached to these lakshana, Sometimes he says they're not, they don't possess them, they don't have them, they don't cling to them. So he uses a lot of different verbs in that sense, but they're all in the negative that bodhisattvas do not cling to or are attached to or even possess these four characteristics. Now, what's really interesting about this is I mentioned this in some earlier session, I can't remember which one now, but I mentioned that there's two ver Chinese versions of this sutra that we're reading. One that was from the year, the mid 400s AD, 430 something AD or so. And then one much later, actually the one that I'm reading from is a translation from a later one that was from the mid 700s. And I mention this because there's slight differences between the two. No surprise, it's been almost 400 years between these two translations. You'd be surprised how similar they are though, which is always kind of um, nice when you notice how similar they are despite hundreds of years being passed. But there is a slight difference between the earlier version and the later version that we're reading. One that I mentioned a few sessions ago, it might have even been in session uh, um, nine when we talked about this Vajra like wisdom of the Buddha. And I mentioned that in the earlier version of this sutra, they don't call it the Vajra like wisdom. They pretty much just call it the wisdom of the Buddha. Fast forward 400 years, and Bodhiruchi, the translator of it, now is calling it the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom. That's a little, it's an interesting little um, thing to notice, right? But then you tie that together with this. If you read the earlier version of this sutra in Chinese, these are in a slightly different order and use slightly different language. Fast forward 400 years, and the sutra, the now our Srimala Sutra, it lists these in the exact same order as the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra and uses the exact same language as the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. That lends a little bit of weight to the idea that when she mentioned, at least in the later 
version, when she mentioned the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom, there's a way in which you could, you should almost read that as referring to the Vajra-like wisdom as found in the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. <laughs> you should definitely always refer to the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra when trying to understand Mahayana Sutras. So if you want to know more about these particular four characteristics, I refer you to that very important Vajra Sutra. But for tonight, to really get what it is that Srimala is getting at, we need to talk about these four. Many of you will probably have heard all of this before. I have a tendency to get in a Vajra like <laughs> zone where all I'm talking about are these things. So if you've heard this before, apologies, but always helpful to hear it again. So again, these are these four characteristics that a bodhisattva is not in is not involved in let's put it that way and the idea here is is that these four are very very interesting and the first thing that we have to get clear is that well at least in the vajra sutra srimala sort of refers to this but she doesn't say it explicitly in the vajra sutra it's very interesting that these are considered lakshana, characteristics or qualities, right? And we, of course, in the Dharma doors, we do a lot of talking about these lakshana, these characteristics. Indeed, the Vajra Sutra does a lot of talking about lakshana and characteristics. But the idea of, of these, of course, is that we tend to identify things. In fact, it may even be how we identify things. Not that we tend to, but that it's actually how we do it. But we identify things by their characteristics or what we consider to be their characteristics. Something, say for example, my yellow uh, sweater uh, hoodie here, right? This morning, I wanted to wear a yellow hoodie. So I went looking for the one that had that characteristic or that quality, the quality of yellowness. Oh, look, there's my yellow one. And I went and grabbed my yellow one. So that's a characteristic or a quality of the visible uh, zone of visible media, color, shape, size. Another one I use often speak of is the idea of being tall, versus being short, you might think that if, if I approached you and I was towering over you, you may attribute to me the quality of being tall, that it's like, oh, Michael, yeah, oh, he's tall. And he's a guy, he's a guy, he's a tall. He's, today he's wearing a yellow hoodie, right? Um, he's got a, a graying beard which is a characteristic or a quality of an older person. So now we're dealing with a male, older person, tall, likes to wear yellow hoodies, all these characteristics, right? Well, let's add four more to those ways in which you may identify me, the four characteristics that you might think are out here, that I'm uh, Michael, the, like, and not anybody else, that I am the, the self, the self of Michael, the personality of Michael. You know, you come to Dharma Doors every Sunday, it's the same me, it's the same personality, same voice, same gesticulations, right? That's Michael. So that's the Pudgala. So the Atman is my utmost self that would, I truly identify me as Michael the personality, then there's the sattva-ness that you might think I'm a sattva. You might think I'm a sentient being because I have sensory organs. I got eyes and ears and nose and tongue. I'm, I'm a lot like those other sentient beings, like little cats and dogs that also have eyes and ears and nose and tongue and a body and a brain. So if you've got sensory organs, you're a sattva. And so you might think Michael the personality, Michael, is a sentient being. 
with also the characteristic of being alive, of being a living entity. So again, what's interesting about these four, just to start us off, is that they're, they're spoken of as characteristics. Now, okay, so if they're characteristics by which you may identify me, because if you, if you came to the Dharma doors and it, it looked like, it looked like that, right? And there was no, what you've come to associate with Michael and the personality and the dude, the sentient being and the life form, if it looked like that, and it, it just the character, those four characteristics weren't here, you'd probably be like, where's Michael? It's Sunday night, it's seven o'clock, where's, where's he at? But then as soon as the, oh, look, can, oh, and he's got yellow, yellow hoodie on, okay. So interesting to then think of these as characteristics. Now well, let's go one level deeper. I wanna start talking about what these four like kind of really, um, or some of their deeper connotations. So the first one is the Atman. And if, of course, if you study Buddhism, you know all about the idea of Atman, and you should know about the idea of the Anatman, this idea, the Buddhist idea that there is no Atman. <laughs> so this has always been a defining characteristic of Buddhism this idea of anatta or anatman in Sanskrit, no atman. But what is an atman? So it's helpful, of course, to know that the idea of an atman, you know, we don't just don't really have this word in English, of course, we don't have the word atman, but we don't even really have a matching word. You could use the idea of a soul but soul is sort of already has a lot of connotations to it that are associated with kind of Judeo-Christian ideas of life and death and heaven and hell and all of that. So you could use a soul, but it has its problems. It's usually translated as the self. And while I think that that is very important to know that that's the connotation is the self, the deeper significance of an Atman has always been this. In Indian culture, Indian philosophy and cosmology, of the, you know, the basic idea, of course, is what we referenced at the beginning of the class, the idea of samsara, the idea of birth, death, and rebirth, that this isn't happening linearly, but it's happening cyclically where we get born, we live a life, we die, and then we're reborn again, and we live a life, and we die, and then we're reborn. And it just keeps going around and around and around. And even though this time I have been born as a American male named Michael and all of these things, the idea of the Atman is that in my next life, I may be reborn as a woman. I may be reborn as a god or a goddess or even a giraffe. In fact, depending on how this plays out, according to original Indian cosmology, depending on how this plays out, I could be reborn in any number of ways with different characteristics. But what would remain me is the Atman. That's what is transmigrating. That is what is experiencing transmigration. That only this time calls itself Michael. Only this time is perceived and perceives itself as um, American male, da 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 da. So the idea is, is that, yeah, all of this is uh, accidental, so to speak. But what is really at the core of this, that is, in a sense, permanent, eternal, indestructible, divine. It's considered kind of a divine aspect of the self or the human in that way. So the whole, not the whole, but a big part of Indian yoga and the more kind of psychophysical practices have traditionally been about trying to 
sort of touch the Atman. And what I mean by touch is a lot of the kind of, again, yogic practices are about understanding that this is all superfluous, understanding that this is all accidental or all of that. And so trying not to identify with this, but trying to get at the Atman. And that way, the idea is, is that if you cannot identify with this particular incarnation, but if you can identify with the Atman, the core, the essence, the soul that's going through all of this, one teaching, not all of the teachings, but one teaching is that if you can touch that and identify with that, you can, in a sense, escape the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, because you will no longer be attached to this, the physical forms of it anymore. You will have kind of cut through all of that and reached the Atman. That's a summary. The, you know, that's a summary of the idea of the Atman or the soul and what a lot of the practices were about. And so everybody was out there trying to find the Atman, to identify it, locate it. And everybody had these different practices for how to do that and different people claiming to have done that. And along comes the Buddha around 500 BC or so. And in the depths of the Buddha's wisdom, the realization was, oh, there just is no Atman. Oh. <laughs> and so that was the original idea of the no self, no soul. <laughs> the idea of no Atman, it actually wasn't originally so much of as about no self as no Atman. <laughs> Again, we don't have a word for it, but it, like, and that's kind of a deeper idea to say no Atman. Now to an American English speaking audience, or actually let me correct that. I don't know if you're American, but to an English speaking audience in that way, you may not th think in terms of Atmans. You might not think in terms of selves, or sorry, think in terms of souls. You might not think in terms of reincarnation. And so there's a way in which you, you might already be over the Atman because you never even got worried about it in the first place. You might already be at that level of not, yeah, no Atman. But that doesn't entirely let you off the hook in that sense. And that sort of brings us to this next one, this idea of a Pudgala. Now, the Pudgala is an interesting one. Again, it gets translated as a personality or individuality. And what's interesting about this idea of a Pudgala is that there was an early, very, very early um, Hinayana, by the way, like so very early school of Buddhism. It's considered one of the 18 schools. So there's considered 18 types or 18 sects of Hinayana, of that early monastic path, one of them being Theravada. But there was another one, one of the 18, and they were actually referred to as the Pudgala Vadins. And it's because it was a group of Buddhists who ascribed to the theory of a Pudgala. And what the idea of a Pudgala was, was this sort of, I mean, if you read the, you know, we don't have a lot of literature uh, on or even from the Pudgala Vadans, so you have to kind of piece together their whole philosophy. But what it seems like they were saying was, oh yeah, Buddha, we get it. No Atman, no essence, no soul. Oh yeah, there's definitely no soul. But there's like a personality though. And it's, you see it, right? With like babies that they like, they have a personality that kind of stays with them their whole life. That there's a way in which Michael might not have an essence or a soul or an Atman, but there's still a kind of 
individuality or personality there that is contiguous, that, that like persists the whole time. Now, this is technically, if, if everybody, um, if you've seen or listened to some of my earlier talks, I often talk about the idea of the self as you can think of the idea of a self as being like a, a little pilot, like just a, a flying a ship, right? Like a little pilot that's kind of between the ears and behind the eyes. And the idea is that we do have the notion that even though I may have gotten a lot bigger since I was born, there's still a sense in which I, I, was, that, I, I was that baby that was born. I was that little kid that went to elementary school. I was that one kid guy that went to college. I was the guy that got married. I, all these things happened to me. And so again, even though I've gotten a lot bigger and all kinds of things have happened to the body, I still have this sense that there's been me there the whole time. You know, me, <laughs> right? So that sense of you as the experiencer of your life, right? That's a funny way to think of it, right? As what is a self? The experiencer of my life. And as soon as you put it in that context as, oh yeah, the experiencer of the, me, the experiencer, you realize immediately this, this person was not in a baby crib as a toddler. This person is like, speaks a bunch of different languages and teaches Dharma classes. This is an entirely different person than the baby. And yet I still say me, or I could look at a picture of me as a baby and say, look, wasn't I cute? And we do this. And in fact, we live this way with that sense that I am the whole thing. I'm like from birth now and, but an interesting aspect to this is that I'm making plans for the future, for the future me, right? I'm making plans for that person who is me. So I am this idea of the experiencer, future and past. And now it's me, hi. Ooh, and I've got it all. And again, just a little bit of scrutiny and that self that you're talking about, it, it, it starts to just slip away where you're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. And that, I, in my Dharma talks, I normally talk about that as anatman, as no self, but it's kind of technically the idea of no pudgala, of no experiencer, no personality or identity in that, in the limited sense, of our life, not the grand sense of our lives, meaning our samsaric existence, which is what the Atman's about. The Pudgala is about this idea of like, you know, again, the self in that way. So those are the first two. And again, the, the original message of Buddhism was about no Atman. So a Bodhisattva not clinging to the Atman yeah, I don't, I don't understand how any bodhisattva could get away with clinging to the Atman. That's, it's, you know, it's so, such a part of Buddhism. But now we're getting into these more interesting nuances. And by the way, would like you to know that when the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra or when Sri Maladevi, when they say no Pudgala, like they're going to kind of say that this has nothing to do with Pudgalas. There's kind of a sense that they're responding to the Pudgala Vadins, that group that believed there was an Atman. And the Vajra Sutra, Mahayana Buddhism, they're saying, no, 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 no. Don't start trying to get attached 
to a personality or identity in lieu of an Atman. And then that brings us to the next one of these. So let's say you were a good Bodhisattva and you were like, okay, Buddha, I didn't believe in an Atman anyways, but you make a strong argument for why I shouldn't even bother thinking there's an Atman. So there's no Atman. I got you. You've also made an interesting argument concerning this Pudgala, this, um, you know, uh, Michael personalities thing. You've made a good argument, Buddha. So yeah, no Pudgala either. That brings us to this idea of being a sattva. Or let me remind you, it's about this idea of having the characteristics of being a sentient being. So the way that you can think about this, and, it, and by the way, if, you've, you know, if you're studying the Vajra Sutra or you want to study the Vajra Praniparamita Sutra, it's very helpful to keep kind of this in mind. That the Atman is this, the biggest sense of self, solar essence. If you get rid of that, you could still have the idea of a, of a transient yet consistent personality. If you were to get rid of that, you could then say, okay, Michael or Buddha, no soul, no essence, no Atma, no personality, but you're like a creature though, right? Like it doesn't need to have a name. It doesn't need to have a sense of occupation or obligations or familiar relationships, or it doesn't have to have any of that, but there's still like a sentient being here, right? Like, you know, a creature. And the way to start to dismantle that idea of having the characteristic of a sentient being. So one of the things that's, you know, been interesting in the kind of late 20th century and definitely in the 21st century here, what's really been interesting in terms of science and actually uh, health and nutrition as well, and maybe more importantly, health and nutrition, in the kind of 20th century, 21st century, there's become this really deep awareness of the, the gut biome, the amount of living things that are in our stomach and also the dentome, I think it's called, all of the organisms and all of the life that's in your mouth that actually kind of eat the food before you eat the food and help you eat the food. So there's a way that you could start to apply that same kind of critical reasoning that we applied to the Atman, that we applied to the personality. And we could really start to drive at this idea of you think, maybe I think it of myself or you think it of yourself or you think it of me. But this idea of that this is one being. Whereas again, we, we actually know scientifically that this is many beings actually function coexisting and functioning simultaneously and it's it, it's sort of like where do you draw the line you need your gut biome you need the dentome you need all of this to function and so it it, it can't be excluded but then what do we again where where is this one sentient being that you think you might be or that you think I am? Where exactly is that one sentient being? And again, what do we do with all of those other sentient beings? Or I should say, what do we do with all that other life that's making up this life? Again, we're just applying some critical reason here to then start to kind of chip away at even this idea of a sat of a sattva of a, a sentient being versus this sort of amalgamation of life working in tandem right oh so it might just be that i appear 
singular, that it's a characteristic, right? So then we go that last step and we go, okay, Buddha, <laughs> you got me. No Atman, clearly. No personality, easily falsified. There's not even a singular sattva, not one singular being. There is this amalgamation of life. And that's where you get to this fourth and final lakshana. The fourth and final characteristic is just the idea of being alive. And I actually want to make something clear because it'll be, it'll be helpful. The, even though in the Sanskrit versions of this, the word appears to be jiva, which does kind of have to do with uh, like life, <clears throat> excuse me, life as almost like a, um, a life force in a way. This is where it's actually helpful when we can read the other languages. Um, I don't read Tibetan, but I can reference Tibetan. And with the Chinese, it's helpful that it, they're, they're much more clear about what this fourth lakshana is about. And yes, it's normally translated as life, but the, especially the Chinese character that's used for this, it's about longevity. But I don't want you to get confused. This isn't about trying to live longer. It's not about longevity in that sense. A better way to translate this final one into English would be lifespan. So not really the life energy itself, but the lifespan. And by, by that, what we mean is no matter what it is, no matter what type of life form it is, there's one question that can be applied to that life form. And in English, we would say something like this, how long did it live? And no matter whether it's a, a fruit fly that is born and dies in the same day, or whether it is a turtle that lives for hundreds of years, or a... Um, were those beautiful, the, those, the really old, old trees, I forget the name of those old trees here in California, like the oldest life form on earth, right? So whether it's those really old trees, the sequoias, turtles, or your know, small, tiny little organisms that really just get born, live and die in, 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 in minutes even, no matter what, all of that, what we have done is thought about it and defined it in terms of how long it was alive. And, and I keep emphasizing this idea of how long, because when we speak of the idea of longevity, we're talking about how long. And it's interesting that in English, we don't say the bristlecone pines, exactly, the ancient bristlecone pines. Thank you so much, Robert. So it's interesting that in English, we don't say, um, how, how short did it live? How short did it go? We, it's always about how long it went. Even if it's only a second or a day, we're, we're still interested in how long it lasted. That's the idea of longevity or lifespan. And that's this fourth characteristic. And what this one is dealing with is, oh, Buddha, you're right. No Atman, no Pudgala, not even a Sattva, but there's like all these life forms, all these little tiny organisms here living, right? <laughs> like we can at least agree on that, right? That I'm living and my cup is not alive, not alive, moving and alive. So we can make that distinction. And the fourth characteristic here that a bodhisattva doesn't cling to, isn't attached to, doesn't possess, doesn't think in terms of, the fourth one is the idea of longevity. And I'm going to do it again. I'm going to take that critical reasoning 
really good classic Buddhist critical reasoning. And let's start chipping away at this one, life. You know what's funny about life? Last time I checked, it's still undefined in many ways. Two ways in particular that I can think of that are very interesting. One has to do with the qualities, the characteristics or qualities by which you may define something as being alive. And what's always so interesting about the definition of life and, and all various definitions, almost invariably fire can meet all of the requirements in terms of needing oxygen or needing a source, needing a fuel source to survive, changing states, all of these different qualities, fire always sneaks in there. A lot of time crystals work their way in there because crystals grow and kind of eat. So there's all of these technical definitions that we would like to apply to the natural world in order to create in a clean division between what is alive and what is not alive. But what's interesting is we can't actually do it. So that's one way that the very definition of life is, we use the word all the time. But when we apply that critical reasoning and we start looking closer, we realize, oh, it's kind of just a word. And that it has a definition, but when you try to match that to reality, reality always wants to do that reality thing where it wants to like water move out of your definition or find the cracks in your definition and move out of it. A second way in which life is not defined is, well, basically this happens periodically with various uh, Supreme Court cases here in the United States regarding euthanasia, regarding people wanting to euthanize loved ones or family members or, or what have you. And then various institutions, health organizations, what have you, having to define when someone is no longer alive, even though they may have brain activity, that's a care, that is a definition for some people, but not all people. Uh, heartbeat, that's for, for some, not for others. There's all of these different criteria. And I'm speaking exclusively for a human being in this case that could be then extrapolated to other mammals at least. But the idea is, is that what exactly do we consider to be alive and not alive? And the idea actually of the idea of say someone is, is um, um, having um, respiratory support, so they're not able to breathe on their own, but there's a machine that can cause their lungs to go in and out. And let's say there's a, a, you need to put a kind of pacemaker on the heart, otherwise the heart would stop beating. But if you give it an electrical shock uh, periodically, it can beat. You start going down that road and all of a sudden, robots and machines would now have to be brought into the fold of what it means to be alive because they're exhibiting all the qualities of someone that we've defined to be alive, <laughs> which is that they are having a heartbeat based on a electrical machine and they're having respiration based on electrical machines and all of that. So again, I'm not certainly trying to define life. All I'm trying to do is make it aware of how difficult it is to actually do that in order to make a little sense of what it means when the Vajra Sutra says, the wisdom of a Bodhisattva understands that these four characteristics are actually just that, lakshana or characteristics. What I mean by that is this, Let's go back to one of my favorite lakshana. One of my favorite characteristics to work with is the one I mentioned about the idea that you might think I'm tall. 
I use this one a lot because I think it's a very, very clear example of something very important. Imagine that I am in a room and I'm, you know, I'm like this, <laughs> hey, how's it going? And it's like, you're just staring, you know, at, and everybody in the room is just staring at the chest and I'm way up there. At that moment, you would be inclined to say, oh, wow. Like, let's say you'd, you'd just been coming to the virtual Dharma doors here and you'd never met me in person. And all of a sudden you go into this room and you're like, wow, I didn't know Michael was so tall. So you would be ascribing to me the characteristic or the quality of being tall, that I possess that quality. But then something interesting happens. We go into the next room that's full of NBA basketball players and they are towering over me. All of a sudden I'm the short guy in the room. What happened to my tallness? I thought I was tall. Now you're telling me I'm short? That's the exact opposite. How is it that I could have the characteristic of being tall and have the characteristic of being short? Doesn't make any sense. And that's when we realize something. Oh, Michael is neither tall nor short. The, all, the tallness or the shortness is all, as we would say, in the eye of the beholder. So that right there is very important to understand. It sure looks like Michael's tall, but wisdom tells me he's not tall. I am conditioned to think that way. <laughs> Let's put it that way for short, right? If you understand that, and if you understand what it means when the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra says, the Buddha says, anywhere there's a characteristic, there's delusion. That's a quote from the Vajra Sutra. And my understanding of that line is, is that if anytime you think the characteristic is out there, that's delusion. If you think the yellowness is here, the yellowness is on my hoodie, think again. It's being manufactured by your eyes and then processed by your brain. And that's the source of the yellowness. Other people with other eyes and other brains are going to see it a whole other way. And so you can't say the yellowness is out here. Yellowness is in there. The tallness is in there. Oh, whoa, wait a minute. Time out. Are you saying, Buddha, that if I were to hold up my little cup and I'm sitting here going, hi, are you saying that the quality of not being alive and being alive is also only in the eye of the beholder and that I am neither alive nor dead? That's what we're saying. That's where we need to be. Is So when Sri Mala says that the Tathagata Garbha is not a self, not a personal identity, not a being, not a life, she goes on to say the Tathagata Garbha is not in the domain of sentient beings. And it's not in the realm of sentient beings who believe in a real self whose thinking is confused. Or she says, it's not in the realm of those who cling to the view of emptiness. So if you want to kind of start to understand the Tathagata Garbha, it's in that realm, <laughs> the character, characteristiclessness, when you're kind of viewing reality through this eye of wisdom that knows all these characteristics and all these judgments and all these things, they're not out there <laughs> in that way. That's kind of the realm of the Tathagata Garbha. And that's where she's saying that samsara, 
is the realm of the Tathagata Garba. That's the base, the basis here, right? Okay, how's everybody doing? Um, Michael, I have a question. Um, yeah. the assumption correct um, that Lakshana or, uh, can't exist in isolation and only can exist in comparison? They are all relative, every single one of them. What is alive is only alive relative to what is dead. But wait, what's dead? That which isn't alive. Oh, it's just, it just goes around and around and around, right? So exactly, Connie, great. Every Lakshana is relative. Even these ones that we think are ironclad to the core. I have a question. Yeah. Um, the, um, so, okay, so like the color is a construction of our, um, uh, of sorts. And so, uh, but, and I mean, I, I have to say, I experienced, I think I experienced this uh, inside of no self when I did a, this is a couple of years ago, I did a single point meditation with uh, some substitute teacher on uh, Michael Taft Thursday night, a blonde lady from the South. I don't know what her name was, but I saw it during that. It was a 90, 60 minute meditation. And there's nothing in my, there's no, no me is what I saw, you know, but, but, uh, but so if there, if this is, um, I mean, mm. if the color is a construction, isn't the eye construction as well? And, you know, all of this. Just keep going. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where it gets tricky, where it's like, oh, whoa. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's pretty amazing yeah anyway i love your i'm glad I, great to I, see you again yeah likewise thanks wonderful all right let's keep moving because now we can have some fun now that our minds are really in that the right uh kind of way in that sense we're gonna move on oh because now we can talk about the dharma Dhatu, tonight's topic so she goes on to say, after laying this out, that the Tathagata Garba, yeah, it's not the realm of being born out of a womb in that way. And it's nothing to do with that. It's this more profound realm. She says, world honored one, the Tathagata Garbha is the Garbha of the Dharma Dhatu. It is the Garbha, the womb of the Dharmakaya. It is the the garbha, it is the womb of the transcendent or super mundane. It is the garbha. It is the womb of intrinsic purity. So now we got to talk about those ideas. I didn't write them down. So, you know, this sutra is so beautiful. It's so filled with linguistic twists in this way where she's really playing with language and you know, I try to share as much of that as I can with you. But now she says that this womb of thusness, this womb of Tathagatas, it is the womb of the Dharma Dhatu. It's the womb of the Dharmakaya, which we talked about the Dharmakaya maybe last uh, two times ago or something like that. She says it's the womb of the transcendent the womb of the super mundane, and then ultimately the womb of intrinsic purity. The one thing that we now will talk about is this idea of the Dharma Dhatu. And in many ways, we're right there. It's been kind of a, a really um, fortuitous Dharma talk, the way this is played out. So this idea of the Dharma Dhatu, that she said the Tathagata Garbha is the womb or the repository of this idea, so this is a very interesting Mahayana Buddhist idea. It's very much a Mahayana Buddhist idea. Um, in particular, what is it? What it's in contrast to is in the normal, basic teachings of Buddhism, applicable to all schools, but definitely a teaching of the early forms of Buddhism. They talk a lot about 
datus. Uh, this word datu, this word uh, jie uh, in Chinese, a jie. It is translated as a realm, a dimension, a sphere sometimes, but sphere as in a dimension, not necessarily an object of a sphere in that way. But early Buddhism, all of Buddhism, they talk a lot about different dimensions, different datus. In particular, they like to talk about the tri datu. The tri datu is the three realms. The realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm. The kama datu, the rupa datu, and the a rupa datu. And it's an interesting way of looking at reality. Again, this is an early Buddhist teaching, one of the earliest. And there's a, actually kind of a way in which this is even a pre-Buddhist teaching, meaning if you were a wise sage of the forests of India, you would know about the three realms. So this is not an idea that's exclusive to Buddhism. Again, it's kind of a, 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 a piece of wisdom that the Buddha inherited. And the, the piece of wisdom is basically very in line with what we were just talking about. So don't forget anything we just mentioned, but that the world that we see in front of us can be understood as having these three dimensions, these three levels or layers to reality. The kamadatu, the realm of desire, is all of, you know, it's not just about the desirability, but it's just all of the judgment and the prejudice and prejudice, good or bad, doesn't prejudgment, but just all of the particulars that we throw on things. A great example of this, of course, is beauty and ugliness, right? We know that if, if there's a painting there, we know that it's not inherently beautiful or ugly, but if somebody views it as beautiful or ugly, that's about a certain filter of their mind. Now, that filter that is kind of judging things and heaping on all kinds of meaning and significance and all of that, that's the realm of desire. And the problem is, is that we often mistake the realm of desire for being just reality, just objective reality. Why doesn't, why doesn't everybody love this painting? This is like the most beautiful painting in the world objectively. <laughs> the realization is, oh no, that's the kamadatu, that we see things through the lens of, of that, lens of past experiences, hopes, desires, all of that. If we're a good meditator, we're mindful, we're aware, we can disambiguate that which we are throwing on to kind of so-called reality, and we can disambiguate that from what is called the realm of form, just the form, just the shape. Like if you're thinking of a painting, not a painting of any, it might be of something, but that's actually still the realm of desire that you're heaping onto it, meaning and significance. The realm of pure form is just the actual shapes, the size of the painting, kind of color, but we've actually already problematized color. So maybe you can talk about light and shadow a little bit, but the realm of form is like really simple in that way. Again, it's like just a um, good example. I always use this as my realm of my, actually my three realms. If, if these for some reason like looked like your parents, and were causing you anxiety or stress because they looked like your parents, that would be the kamadatu. But if you pull back from the kamadatu and just see the shape, it's not even a face. It's not even a face. It's just a shape. That's the realm of form. What's interesting is that the formless realm is here too. And what I mean by that is, is the realm of form is it has a form, it has a shape. Oh yeah, what's this in the shape of? As soon as your mind decides it's the shape of two faces, you have dipped into the realm of formlessness and created form. 
oh, it's two faces. Or you've reached into the formless realm and pulled out a glass or a goblet. So the formless realm is this really, really wild realm where nothing is yet in a way. And then the discriminatory conditioned mind comes along and orders it in a sense. And then heaps all kinds of significance and fears and desires and angst on top of what it has disambiguated out of the realm of formlessness. So that's like a very quick lesson in basic Buddhist ideas of the three realms. This is also a dot two, but the Dharma dot two is outside. Of, in fact, she said it, it's the trans mundane. It's out of this world. And so what I mean is, is this, everything that I just walked you through regarding the faces, the glass and all of that, it was all predicated on the subject object experience of you experiencing something. The idea of the Dharma dot two is it's a whole way of viewing reality, but not doing that. <laughs> It's kind of speaks to non-duality in that way. But when Joshua asked that, or he went on his great um, thought uh, uh, explosion, that was wonderful. And when we got to this idea of like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. It's all, every single Dharma, every single phenomenon, no matter how big, no matter how small is and this is going to tie into Connie's comment about, oh, they're all relative. They're all relative and none of them are real in that way. Welcome to the Dharma Dhatu. In other words, the Dharma Dhatu is not this kind of peeling back these layers. It's actually encountering what is right in front of you as it appears but understanding it in an entirely different way. And ultimately, out of wisdom, understanding exactly why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. Having the a full, clear wisdom of why this is the experience in that way. That's the Dharma dot two. It's a very, it's a subtle, much more subtle dot two then even this, the, the, the three dot twos, which are already pretty subtle, but this is very subtle. And by the way, I can use this tremendous opportunity where we have all been well informed as to the Dharma dot two and what that means. Now we can understand the Dharma kaya, the Dharma body. The Dharma body is your body in the Dharma Dhatu? In that realm of, <laughs> of that realm that we just talked about. So this body that I worry about getting sick and I worry about the wrinkles and I have this whole narrative about the few, this body, that body's trapped in samsara and da 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 da. But there's this other body, which is this body but it's not this body because in the Vajra Sutra, the Buddha says, what is not a great body is called a great body. So, <laughs> which is by the way, referencing this idea of the Dharmakaya. Okay, everybody with me, everybody doing good. Excellent, excellent. So now we know why and how the Tathagata Garbha is the Garbha it's the womb, it's the storehouse of the Dharma Dhatu, the Dharma Kaya, the super mundane, that which is out of this world, because this body's in this world. Dharma Kaya is out of this world in that sense. And then the last thing she says is, and the Tathagata Garbha is the Garbha of intrinsic purity. And that's what's really going to make. Srimala's discourse new and exciting and unique. It's not this, this 
Hinayana, early Buddhist pessimism and downer attitude of this impure world, it's actually about the purity of the Dharma Dhatu. That purity of, the, of a realm that is fully equalized, where all dharmas are equal in that sense, right? This, she goes on to say, this intrinsically pure Tathagata Garbha, as I understand it, is always the inconceivable state of the Tathagata, the Buddha, the thus come one, even if contaminated by defilements. The adventitious dust of defilements. How is this? World honored one, the mind, whether virtuous or non virtuous, changes from moment to moment, and it cannot be contaminated by defilements, the kleshas, that adventitious dust. How is this? Defilements are not in contact with the mind. The mind is not in contact with defilements. How can anything that is not in contact with the mind contaminate the mind? Yet, world honored one, because there are defilements, there is a defiled mind. It is extremely difficult to know and understand contamination by defilements. Only the Buddha, the world honored one, who is the I, the wisdom, the root of the Dharma, the guide, and the foundation of the true correct Dharma, only the Buddha can know and see it as it is. Then the Buddha praised Queen Sri Mala, saying, excellent, excellent, just as you have said, it is difficult to know and understand how the intrinsically pure mind can be contaminated by defilements. Sri Mala, there are two things difficult to understand. What are the two? First, the intrinsically pure mind. Second, the contamination of this mind by defilements. Only you and those bodhisattvas who have already accomplished the great dharma can accept, harmonize, parigraha, these two dharmas upon hearing them. The Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas understand them only through faith. That's the end of chapter 13. Okay, making excellent time on this. Any questions, comments, answers, or ideas pop out to anybody? Thing pop up. Uh, I have a question, or with the part you're just talking about, uh, the, the understanding only comes through faith. Uh, I remember a while back you recommended, a, um, gosh, what was it called? Something about the faith, something about faith. It was a book the awakening, or a writing. The Awakening of Faith. What, awakening of Faith, yes. Is that, is that related to this? It is. However, I... Let's start there. Okay. I want you to know, and, and I'm not sure, Joshua, you know, if you've seen the previous uh, episodes of this. So this whole sutra, our, our hero, our heroine, Srimala, has been praising sort of the Mahayana and really kind of putting down the Shravaka Prateki Buddha, which is the early Hinayana path. Yeah. And what she's saying here is that and I want to say a few words about this idea of the intrinsically pure mind and then the, def the defilement of that intrinsically pure mind. 
But what she's saying is, and what the Buddha is saying, is that this is a really, really profound, hard to understand idea. And in fact, the Pratekya Buddhas and Shravakas, they only understand it out of faith, like out of respect for the Buddha that it's right. But this is about really understanding it, not just because the Buddha said it in that way. Cool. And now let's talk about. Hey, hey, uh, oh, sorry. Let me, let me just jump in real quick. Yo, please, um, please, and, please. and if this is because uh, I've, you know, all of these, um, uh, the, the jump that you made to, uh, and I'm glad that Joshua asked that question because I think I was going to ask a question that that answers. Uh, the, uh, when you were like, oh, you know, if you're, if you're in the Dharmakaya, then uh, you somehow have the, you, have, you understand why it is that what is being presented is being presented to you. I mean, that seems like a leap, but maybe, and I'm all right with that, but uh, how, how did you get to that conclusion? <clears throat> so if, if we understand this sort of, um, these various steps, and the various steps I'm talking about are like when I start talking about me being tall, and then we realize I'm not tall, but it sure looks that way. And then we identify the original source of that tallness, which again is in the eye of the beholder that way. And if I were to go a little further with that one, what's interesting about tallness is that the way that I put that one is that I was in a room full of tall people or short people. And so there's that difference going on. And so you might say, oh yeah, you're the tall one. But what happens when this isn't um, a, uh, a room full of different sized people? And let's just say this is a, a, a situation where we've never met in person. And then we meet. And because I'm seven feet tall, I'm not seven feet tall, of course, but let's say I am seven feet tall. Just that alone, you'd probably be like, oh, wow, I didn't know Michael would be so tall. But again, that only speaks to all the people you've met in your life in that way, that you already have this sort of understanding of what a normal person is, and then you can judge based on that. So what I'm getting at is, is that the first step is to understand I'm not tall. The tallness is being kind of manufactured in your mind in that sense. Then you can go deeper and you can be like, oh, and that's why I would even consider that to be tall to begin with. But I'm not going to leave you just there, Brendan. I want to give you a really good example. Good. I've used that this... That's not going to work. So yeah, yeah you no, gotta, I knew, gotta, I knew that was for the <laughs> other people. <laughs> so the example of what I'm talking about is this. And this is a good example, I think, of my message about the Dharma Dhatu very quickly. Imagine, this is my analogy. Imagine you have, I don't have one around. Oh yeah, I do. Imagine you got a, a nice clean sheet of paper. Tabla rasa, right? Imagine, and now I don't have this, but imagine I had a pin and I were to poke a hole in the piece of paper with my little pin, right? Let's pretend in my analogy that this represents a, um, you, you know, let, okay, let's play this way. We're not in the realm of reincarnation. We're not in the realm of reincarnation. So we have a view that when a baby is born, it has a totally blank mind, tabla rasa. And maybe this happens in utero, before birth, maybe it happens after birth, but the conditioning begins. Let the conditioning begin, right? Imagine that this piece of paper was that tabla rasa baby mind, 
and my pin and my pinholes are all of the various conditioned experiences. You can think of them almost like, um, well, actually, let's say I have a whole variety of sizes of pins and they go from the microscopic to bigger to some big old ones. And what these pins represent are kind of traumatic events, so to speak, that condition us to, into having certain responses. And there's like little micro traumatic responses that just make us move a certain ways. And then there's like major ones that really cause us to be who we are in that way. So imagine you've got this tabla rasa mind, but then starting process starts, right? All of these little holes. Imagine now after a certain number of years or whatever of this happening. Imagine analogously that I were to take this now piece of paper that has all these holes in it and all of these holes are, you know, the history of your mind in that way. And now imagine I had like a, um, a light. So it was like a bright light, like when you were a kid and I blasted a light through this piece of paper and it projected onto the wall in front of you a, <clears throat> the constellations of your mind, all of the little holes, all the big holes. And it would almost be like, behold, on the wall in front of me, my mind, a perfect representation of, of the state of my mind, right? What I meant when I said that you would be able to understand why is that you can do the same thing right now, Brendan, which is behold your mind. The reason why this is the experience is because of all those past conditionings to view it this way. And if you understand it that way, you can almost reverse engineer why your mind is the way it is. And my point about that is, is that when you see that projection of the state of mind on the wall, and then when I suggest that you can view what is right in front of you as the exact same kind of projection, when we're viewing it that way, we're viewing the Dharmadhatu. When we're viewing it as, nope, I'm here and that's something that I want. Gimme, do. If it's a subject object experience, that's samsara, that's turning around and the whole thing. But if you're viewing it as, oh, <laughs> this is just a perfect, and I, I wanna use my language very carefully. Oh, this is a perfect representation of my flawed mind. But it's, per it's a perfect representation of my conditioning. That language I'm using of perfect is a sort of idea of purity. It's, it, it's, it's a perfect representation of it. It may suck, but that would be my interpretation of it or my opinion of it or what have you. But, but that it be this way is revealing in that sense. That's what I meant, Brendan. I got to be perfectly honest, halfway through, I was looking at my mind uh, being annoyed with that response, but actually, no, that was, that was beautiful. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, you went for it. That's great. Uh, yeah, that is cool. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Blowing me away. Right on. Excellent. Happy to be here. Happy to do it. And by the way, that's 830. Um, so we've made it through chapter 13. Chapter 14, chapter 15. I don't know how far we'll get next time, but tune in to find out. <laughs> Thank you.